welcome you to class number three of the biological theory of ionization. Last week we showed you John Ott's movie on light and, and TV radiation, fluorescent light, sunlight. Now this movie <clears throat> is so full of information that seeing it one time you will not begin to grasp the parameters in it. I've seen this movie perhaps 25 times and each time I learn something new as I, and think about new parameters. So I, for the first few moments this evening, I want to continue discussing sunlight and what it can do for the human body. Now I have a list here. Generally I do not use notes, but in making these films I want to be sure and not leave anything out. So I made a little list of some things that I want to cover on light. Sunlight lowers high blood pressure. Now this will be a very interesting thing because millions and millions of people have high blood pressure and we're going to discuss this in more detail this evening and in future evenings. It lowers high sugars in diabetics. Now this would be of interest to many people who are diabetic. It decreases cholesterol in the blood and we're going to discuss that in somewhat detail this evening. It um, makes the white blood cell count come up, which helps fight disease and infectious diseases. It increases the sex hormone to testosterone in men, one of the greatest aphrodisiacs. It also brings energy and helps the muscles to gain strength. Muscle builders who are trying to uh, get on all kinds of health kicks and build these big grotesque muscles think that they have to eat a high protein diet to have big muscles and this is not true. In fact, the high protein diet as we will discover in class number four can actually be very dangerous to their health and will not help them build bigger muscles. It increases, the sunlight increases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. We will discuss that further this evening. It also helps the lactic acid when you do uh, content of the blood. It, it uh, eliminates it and helps it to not make your muscles sore. You know how when you exercise you're not used to it and the next day you're very sore because you manufacture lactic acid uh, as you exercise and sunlight helps neutralize that. And so we want to go back and discuss this evening particularly uh, cholesterol. This is on everybody's mind and there was an article in the local paper just recently about the amazing high cholesterol of even young people in grade school here in this particular area where we're at. There was an article in the local paper. Now I have drawn on the board a chemical diagram of the molecular structure of cholesterol. You probably will have difficulty in seeing it. This says HO, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, one atom of carbon, three of hydrogen. Again, carbon, hydrogen, three, carbon, hydrogen, three, carbon, hydrogen, three, and carbon and hydrogen, three. Now this is the molecular structure of cholesterol, whichever is on everybody's mind. You see it on all the TV ads and so forth. But now when sunlight comes along, something happens. One little atom of the hydrogen is knocked out and you have two there instead of three. This little bridge is taken out and comes up like that. And that, that one little change, that's all, all the change there is. And what happens is in your skin is this cholesterol, the fat under the layer of skin. When the sunlight hits that and penetrates that, it makes this little tiny change in the cholesterol and it suddenly becomes a new substance. This is the formula for vitamin D3. And that's the only difference is one little atom of hydrogen and this little bridge knocked out here and you have vitamin D3. Now an amazing thing happens when this is converted to vitamin D3. Just a few minutes in sunlight and a terrific amount of cholesterol is converted to vitamin D3. So immediately the body moves more cholesterol out of the arteries and bloodstream, moves it up to under the skin to replace that which was converted to vitamin D3. And so you actually lower your cholesterol level in the bloodstream by using bathing in the sun. And it's a very pronounced uh, 
lowering of it. Uh, in one test on a 65-year-old woman, they found that in one sunbathing session, she had a 13% drop in triglycerides and cholesterol in the blood. Now, that's very significant. And in a period of a few weeks of sunbathing, she came right down to normal just from sunbathing, doing nothing else. And so we're going to discuss sunbathing more uh, in detail this evening and what it can do for you. And so this is an amazing thing. There are four things related to cholesterol. Cortisone, the sex hormone to testosterone, vitamin D3, and cholesterol. They're all of the same family. Now when you sunbathe, men have a great increase in the male sex hormone, to testosterone. And this is w one of the greatest aphrodisiacs known. Everybody's always trying to come up with some sex stimulant. Sunbathing is it. And so it has a profound effect on the human body. Now I'm going to take this off the board because we're going to discuss some other things and I want to draw, and my board really isn't as big as it should be to get everything on it. I don't want to erase these other things. But as we sunbathe, we find that people are very skeptical of sunbathing because you are constantly seeing on TV how that you're going to get skin cancer if you do much sunbathing. And so why are we afraid of skin cancer? And why do we get skin cancers from sunbathing? It's an abnormality. It is not normal to get skin cancers from sunbathing. The reason we get skin cancers from sunbathing is because of an improper diet. We have too many fats in our diet, and particularly the fats of polyunsaturated fats that are advertised so highly on television. They're always advertising this corn oil and that corn oil or, or some vegetable oil and polyunsaturated, no cholesterol, and you think it's a health food, when in reality, polyunsaturated fats are one of the most devastating things that you can put in the human body because they, when they are reacted with, with sunlight, they make these free radicals that we mentioned in tape number one. The free radicals, which are chemicals that have an electron knocked off and become highly reactive and positively charged and are carcinogenic. And so polyunsaturated fats are, are devastating to the human body. Now, if we ate the, a vegetable product or a grain that had polyunsaturated fats in them naturally, then they would not be bad because they have other factors in, such as vitamin E, which is an antioxidant. The vitamin E prohibits the polyunsaturated fat from turning into a free radical. But when they process these grains, and make these pure, clear vegetable oils that you see, they are virtually just a bottle of chemicals. They're not natural at all. There's no vitamin E in them to help them from turning into these free radicals. And so they are not a natural substance at all, and they, it, it should be outlawed to even advertise them as a health food because they are devastating to the human body and the greatest single cause of free radicals which upsets the entire body chemistry. And, and this is, this is a really a, an important and devastating thing. Now, another interesting thing that sunlight does, and we'll come back to this um, again here in a minute and tell you some other things, but another thing that happens is when sunlight, or when you don't get sunlight, your little red blood cells become very thick wall. They have a very thick wall on them, and they cannot transfer oxygen in and out. They're sluggish, and so they can't, are not efficient in transferring oxygen. When you get plenty of sunlight, you have thin-walled ones which can, which can transfer oxygen into the cells more efficiently. Now, when you're also eating the high fat, cholesterol or, or not, whether it's animal fat, and that has cholesterol in it, but if it's not animal fat and polyunsaturated, too much oils in your diet makes these red blood cells clump together in little clusters. They will glue together in clumps. Now most, <clears throat> most red blood cells are seven microns in diameter. Seven microns, that's seven millionths of a meter. It's a little bitty thing. 
You can't see it with the naked eye. All right, a lot of your fine blood vessels are only four microns in diameter. Now, how do you put a seven micron blood cell through a four micron blood vessel? Well, if they're clumped together, there's no way. They cannot go through. They stop up that blood cell or blood vessel. The oxygen is cut off to that area and it begins to die in a trophy. And it also sets up a condition where cancer can grow. Cancer does not like oxygen. And so you shut your oxygen off to an area in fine blood vessels with these clumped together blood uh, cells. Now, if you drink alcohol in excess, it also tends to clump your blood cells together and shuts off oxygen to various parts of your body. So we want to keep our blood cells singular floating around, thin-walled, and then when they hit this little four micron blood vessel, they will fold over like that and squeeze through like a football kind of. They, instead of staying round like a, a plate, they will fold over and elongate and then they can go right on through uh, the small blood vessels. Now there are various ways that you can do this. Vitamin E helps to keep the blood thinned. Also when we get down here to water, which is next on our list, we'll find that drinking plenty of water helps thin our blood and keep these cells from clumping together. There's several things that do that. But vitamin E is a powerful antioxidant which helps free radicals not to form in the body. Now after free radicals, we none of us have a perfect diet, so we are going to have free radicals. We'll show you later how you even manufacture them in your colon. But there's another substance that helps get rid of the free radicals and prevent them from doing damage. And that is the mineral selenium. Selenium helps uh, counteract free radicals after they're formed. Vitamin E helps to keep them from forming. So those two, uh, vitamin and mineral, are very important in the human body. Now there are other antioxidants, and such as vitamin C is a very potent antioxidant. In fact, uh, you use it in uh, lettuce, if you spray lettuce with lemon juice or something, it won't turn brown real quick. And uh, you can, that's because of the antioxidant nature of vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Now, another vitamin that's very important in this chain is vitamin A. Vitamin A helps prevent free radicals from being formed when the sun hits the skin in excess. Now, your sunbathing should be done be around up to about 10 o'clock in the morning, but from 10 to 2, you have an, a terrific amount of shortwave ultraviolet coming down from the sun. The real shortwave ultraviolet is the burning one that really uh, gets you. So you should not do your sunbathing between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock or so. This, this daylight saving time, you have to make a little adjustment there. But vitamin A helps to prevent sunburning and damaging of the skin, particularly in the form of beta carotene, or carotene, which you get from carrots and squash and uh, different vegetables. Beta carotene is a wonderful source and is also now recognized in the past few months as being a, one of the most powerful anti-cancer vitamins. It's vitamin A. Now, if you take vitamin A in the synthetic palmitate form, you can get too much of it and do liver damage. But it's almost impossible to get too much in the form of carotene or beta carotene. One of my favorite ways of getting it is through carrot juice. But there's a sleeper in the carrot juice. You only get good vitamin A in California carrots. If you go buy a Florida carrot and juice it, you'll think you've been poisoned. It tastes so awful. If you get a Texas carrot, it tastes like dirty dishwater, chlorine, because Texas has lots of chlorine in the soil and the root crops are rich in chlorine and Texas carrots taste awful. Michigan carrots do not taste good either because they lack iodine in the soil, which is needed in the carrot. And about the only good carrots you get are 
from San Joaquin Valley and those uh, good rich areas of California and some areas of Arizona, and they will be sweet. Now, here's a, a thing we'll, we'll hit a little harder in the diet, but the sweeter a vegetable, the more sugar it has, the more mineral content it has. The higher the sugar content, the higher the mineral content, or vice versa. And we have a little instrument that we use called a refractometer. You can put a drop of juice in it or anything and look in there and you'll see numbers. And you can read and put a drop of carrot juice or any other vegetable juice in it. And you can tell its mineral and sugar content and whether it's good or not. And, and sharp buyers of produce in Florida and different places, they carry a little refractometer with them. And then when they buy green beans and this and that, they squeeze a little juice out and put it in there and look in their refractometer. And they can tell if those vegetables have been properly grown, picked at the proper time, and have the proper minerals in it. And it's interesting that a grapefruit <clears throat> hanging on a tree or an orange, there will be more minerals in the bottom half than there will be in the top half. And I have demonstrated that in the past in the class. I would bring a grapefruit and a refractometer, and we'd take a little juice out of the bottom, a little juice out of the top, and you'll get a different reading because the bottom half will have more in it. And that's uh, very interesting. But vitamin A is just a terrifically important vitamin for people who are sunbathing or for anyone who, who don't want to get skin cancer or internal cancers. Now as we're talking about internal cancers, way back in the 1930s in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they recognized that sunbathing inhibited the growth of internal tumors and cancers. And that has since been proven over and over. And yet, it's almost impossible to get a person who has cancer to do sunbathing. They just will not take you serious, won't believe it. But it inhibits the growth of tumors. Sunbathing does. And so we need to intelligently do our sunbathing, but everyone needs to get sunlight. And as we saw in the movie, it has all kinds of other effects on us. Now, do you remember last week in the movie where they had these rats and they did an autopsy on them and showed the uh, muscle tissue. And the rat that did not get full spectrum light had calcium deposits in his muscle tissue. Now, sunlight also has a very definite bearing on our assimilation and use of calcium. Calcium is, a, is the most used, uh, used more than any other mineral in the body. Women use about seven times more calcium than men. Women need terrific amounts of calcium. But if you're not getting full spectrum light and sunlight, you're not going to have a calcium balance in your body, and you will have calcium deposits. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I can't take calcium. My doctor told me not to drink milk and not to take calcium supplements because I have spurs and so forth. Well, that, that is not normal. That is because of an imbalance in the entire body chemistry because you need that calcium. But if you're not getting sunlight or full spectrum light, then you cannot properly assimilate that calcium. If you're taking the wrong kind of calcium, you will also have calcium deposits. And we're going to get into calciums quite heavily in the next um, class. But now <clears throat> we want to move on here and to show the relation of water to this formula. Now, we're going to develop this formula a little more, and as soon as I get through with water, we're going to move to the first number here. But water is the transporting mechanism for all of the ionized minerals in the human body. You, all the, uh, going into the cells and out, it's all done with water and ionized minerals. But now our water supply in America and all over the world is becoming slowly a disaster. We have, uh, we're polluting our underground wells, our water streams, our lakes, and everything is being polluted with industrial wastes. And as you know, we have the Yadkin River coming down from Winston-Salem past Salisbury. That river has so much junk in it that in the summer, when it gets low and it's hot and all these chemicals are in there, you have fish kills. I remember year after year where thousands of fish die. And sometimes the catfish will actually jump out of the water and die rather than to stay in it. It's so bad. They just can't stand it anymore. And yet they suck that water up at Salisbury, put a few more chemicals in it, and say, here, have a toddy. 
drink this. And there's about 43 different chemicals in that water, including and the chlorine is just one of them, and it turns to chloroform in the body, which is a powerful carcinogenic material. And so water is getting to be a real problem to find pure water. Personally, I drink distilled water. I distill my water. That's the only way I know now to get pure water. You can't catch it, uh, rain water and get pure water because it's bringing down all the industrial pollution with it, automobile exhaust, nitrous oxide, sulfuric acid, which is killing our uh, timberland all up north. This is acid rain that you hear about so much. Rainwater is no longer safe. When I was a child, you could catch rainwater, and that was the purest water you could get. But now it's, it's, uh, it's terrible. It's even got radioactive fallout in it. And while we're talking about radioactive fallout in water, this is on everybody's mind now after the Russian disaster about radioactivity. We could not live without a certain amount of radioactivity in our, uh, to, in our cells. All right, I'm going to draw a little diagram here very crudely. That's the double helix coil that's in every cell of your body. It has this little double helix coil in it which has the memory cells in it, a pattern of your body. And they duplicate themselves and keep reduplicating according to the pattern of your body. That's how you don't uh, change shape much over, just slowly over a period of years. All right, this little double helix coil has the memory as a pattern of your body in it. All right, when radioactive radiation hits that coil, it will break it many times. If it breaks it once or twice, that little coil will heal back and be more vigorous and healthy than it was before. But if you break it four or five or six times, it, won't, it will lose its ability to heal back and, and lose its memory circuit. And it will mutate and, and get confused. And then you have a mutated cell. Now the people at Hiroshima, and I was there just a matter of a few weeks after the bomb, uh, fell, but the people that received a certain 10 to 110 uh, rads of radiation there are healthier and more disease free today than the general population. It invigorated them, but the ones that received more than that, it confused their memory cells and they mutated and they got all, they got cancer, leukemia, and everything under the world wrong with them and died. And if you get, break it too many times, you die just in a matter of hours. But radiation is in itself is not all bad. Because, in fact, we must have it. These little double helix coils are strummed kind of like guitar strings, and they oscillate and vibrate on frequencies. You remember in the first class, I mentioned frequencies. And so you have lots of frequencies in the, uh, in the body, and these little double helix coils have a, their antennas. They transmit and receive like a miniature short wave set, and they need radiation. But we could, I could spend uh, two classes just on radiation, but that is beyond the scope of this um, lecture here. We don't want to get there too deep. But water is so essential to the human body that we can't live without it, but most people don't get enough even though they drink water and they don't drink water properly. The, one of the finest ways to drink water to detoxify the body is to drink four ounces every 30 minutes and you'll get maximum efficiency in washing junk out of your body. Now if you weigh 150 pounds, take that and divide it by half to 75, convert that to ounces, 75 ounces, and that's how much water you need in a day. Different body weights need different amount of water. Now, unfortunately, we don't all get thirsty, a lot of, especially in the winter time. We have to tell ourselves, drink some water, because you go all day and you don't get thirsty in the winter. So you say, I need to drink water, and you have to educate your mind to drink water. And if you will do that, you will wash out a lot of junk. I have actually seen this happen. I visited a friend in Indiana a few years ago, he had gout so bad that he was walking on crutches. He couldn't put any weight on his feet or anything because of these uric acid crystals in his feet and legs. And we were talking about this water, 
And I said, well, why don't you try drinking distilled water, this four ounces every 30 minutes, and just see what it does for you. He says, well, 69 cents a gallon, what have I got to lose? So he bought some water. I went on home, and two days later, he called me all excited. He says, man, I'm off my crutches already. In two days, 48 hours, just drinking that water and washing that soluble urea acid crystals out of his feet there. So simple. He drank uh, about two jugs of water there for a dollar, dollar something, and he'd been on crutches and couldn't work and do anything, just a simple little thing of water. And, and pure water it ha has a marvelous effect. It helps change this formula, and I'm going to show you next week some dramatic ways of changing this formula that we won't get into tonight with water and how it can even prevent heart attacks. If you drink water properly, you can wipe out about two-thirds of all the heart attacks in America in 48 hours. And we're going to go into that next week about water and heart attacks. Now, this evening, we want to start on this formula a little. This 1.5 represents putting a drop of urine in a refractometer, a little device that reads sugars or total carbohydrates. Now, this, we call this a sugar reading, but it is different than a sugar reading that a doctor would do on blood sugar if he took your blood and did a sugar reading. This is, this is total carbohydrates, including sugar. And we uh, say that if you were in perfect health and all of these numbers were perfect, you should have a 1.5. Now, in the Reams formula, no number is perfect unless all numbers are perfect. If any of these numbers are off, then this number is all automatically off, even though it's 1.5. You have to have all numbers perfect for any of them. In fact, if you had all of these numbers perfect, say, except this one, and this is a 4M instead of a 0.04M, and all of these others are like that, you would probably be virtually ready to die, as I pointed out the other evening, because you'd be throwing out tremendous amount of dead cells in relationship to what these other formulas were. And so you cannot judge this formula on any one number. You have to look at it as a whole. And so as you learn to read this little formula here, it is absolutely fascinating. It points out parameters in your body that most people have never thought of. And we're going to discuss it uh, more fully. Now, this evening, I have so many things I wanted to cover that I wish to, I really, you're going to have to tell me when my time is half up, uh, when, when 30 minutes is up, so I can uh, do my thinking here and get oriented. But we want to stress so much. We, we need pure air. We need sunlight. This sunlight can be used for so many things that we could talk for two, three evenings on that alone. And the water is so important. The reason, what, another reason that water is so important is over here, 6 to 7C is salts, S-A-L-T-S, -S, plural. You manufacture salts in your body whether you eat salt or not. These two numbers are the pH, the acid-alkaline balance of the body. Now, number 7, pH, is neutral, neither acid nor alkaline. Uh, 8 is 10 times more alkaline. A six is 10 times more acid. It's a logarithmic scale. And so this a six to eight would be a hundredfold different, 10 times 10. And so this pH tells us a lot about the body. To understand pH, for instance, baking soda is a very alkaline substance, and vinegar is a very acid substance. If you put vinegar and baking soda together, they fizz and bubbles come up and they neutralize each other and you have a salt residue. Anytime you neutralize an acid and an alkaline, you manufacture a salt. Isn't that, that's this basic high school chemistry. So when your pHs get all off, you will be manufacturing salts in your body. All right. A 6.4 is considered the ideal pH where you can pull the maximum amount of minerals from your food. In agriculture, we test the soil, and they set 6.5 as their norm, 
You could use either one of these. They're so close together. But that is the ideal pH for most plants to grow. Now, when you grow more alkaline or more acid, the plants lose their ability to pull nutrients from the soil. So what do we do? All right, if we go acid, the soil, I, I believe I heard something on the radio the other day about North Carolina soil got clear down to 4.5. was not an unusual pH for the soil in North Carolina. Now, 4.5 is 100 times more acid than what plants want to use. So you can't grow good crops on a soil of 4.5. So the farmers buy lime, which is calcium, to put on their land to neutralize that and bring that pH up. Then their plants can begin to grab nutrients out of the soil. Now, the Bible tells us that we're created out of the dust, we're made of the dust of the colloidal minerals of the ground. And our pHs work exactly the same way as the dirt. All right? So well, they buy the lime. All right, but unfortunately, the farmers get tricked a little bit. They buy dolomitic lime almost exclusively. A few of them know to buy the high calcium lime that's not dolomite lime. Dolomite lime has about 40% magnesium in it. Now, magnesium is an antagonist of nitrogen. It latches on to nitrogen and ties it up and makes it into a substance that the plant can't use. Now, that is beautiful for the fertilizer companies. They sell the farmer the dolomitic lime. It cuts his nitrogen off, so he goes and buys nitrogen. Then they say, now use murate of potash for your potash. It's 40-some percent chlorine. They, so they're saying chlorinate your soil, kill all the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, then he goes and buys more nitrogen. So the poor farmer's broke. He can't utilize nature's nitrogen. He has to buy uh, this liquid ammonia and so forth to keep his nitrogen level up. And the, the fertilizer companies increase their pocketbook. And, and, and this, this is a, a, an agricultural disaster. But now in the human body, we can use that knowledge, the dolomitic lime with the magnesium, we can use to tie up nitrogen, but I'm not going to go any further with the nitrogen tonight because we want to develop that in its fullness next week. But this pH tells us an awfully lot about the body. Now, as you go to high school chemistry, you have what you call a periodical chart of elements. Anybody that's studied any chemistry at all, you know you got this thing of all the basic elements, the periodical charts, and they have atomic weights. We find that the higher the periodical number of an element, the more difficult it is for the human body to pull it out of the food, the trace elements. The further this pH gets off from 6.4, the more difficult it will be for you to grab trace elements from the foods you eat. Now, these little delicate high uh, periodical number trace elements are extremely important catalysts. A catalyst, look upon it as a preacher. A preacher performs a wedding. He joins two people together, but he doesn't become part of that union. But he's the catalyst that joins them in marriage. And so a catalyst minerals are that way too. They do not become part of our body or cells necessarily, but they bring about chemical reactions of the macro or major minerals. Now we are told by some nutritionists and some colleges that there's no difference in a tomato, whether it's grown organically or whether it's grown with nitrate of soda in sand in Florida or whether it's grown here or there. A tomato is a tomato is a tomato or a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. But that is not true. If these micronutrients or trace elements are left out, you may have all of the major elements in that carrot, but you cannot utilize it because the catalysts are not there, the trace elements. And there's a, there's a difference in taste also, which you, if you do a little experimenting with carrots or any other plant. Do you know we have a generation of children today who do not know what food tastes like? If you, go, if you eat out of a restaurant or at a grocery store, which 90% of the people do, you've never tasted a fresh vegetable. The vegetables you get in a grocery store that were picked a week or two ago in Florida have no flavor whatsoever. 
You go out in your garden and pick a simple little old yellow crook neck squash that's fresh, bring it right in, slit his throat, steam it lightly with a little butter in it, and it's good. You go to a grocery store and buy that squash that's been, that's been picked two or three weeks ago in Florida, and it's tasteless. And, and so young people say, ooh, I hate vegetables, ugh. And they do taste bad. They have no flavor at all. There's no sweetness, there's no sugar in them, nothing. But if you, you pick fresh vegetables, beets or anything, and they're good because the sugar content and mineral content are higher. So it, it's really a, a, a sad thing uh, what we're doing to our diets and educating young people to not like vegetables because vegetables are a fantastic things. They have fiber and all the minerals and vitamins. I tasted a tomato that Dr. Maynard Murray sent me. He was experimenting with sea salts, which has all kinds of trace minerals, and was growing some hydroponically in liquid vats in Florida, and he put this sea salt in there, which has every trace mineral known in the ocean. And these tomatoes, he sent them to me green, and I thought, why? I've never tasted a green tomato and let it ripen and it'll taste like a plastic tomato. He sent it to me at Christmas time, two boxes of them, and I let them ripen, and I was amazed when I tasted them. They taste just like fresh summer tomatoes right out of the garden, and the only difference was they had all the trace minerals in them, and they were absolutely delicious. And so we need to adjust our pHs. Now, how do we adjust our pH? It's not unusual to find a person that will be maybe a 7.4 over 7.2, very alkaline, or another one that is 5.2 over um, maybe even a 5, very acid. And you have a war going on in the body. You, you're making salts, generating them. Now, and you have a really bigger problem when you see a person with, say, a 7.4 over a 5.2, a split pH. Now you really got a war going on because you got one way up and one way down, maybe a hundredfold apart, and fighting each other. And that's more, even more difficult to deal with. Now the blood in the body maintains a constant pH of approximately 7.35. And your blood can't vary but a few tenths of a point from that or you die. You can't tolerate uh, even one point this way or that in the bloodstream or you'll just get very seriously dead. All right, there are minerals in the body constantly trying to regulate the pH. Calcium is one of the big minerals that tends to regulate the pH and hold it in check. Along with water, along with sunlight, which we're talking about, all of these are your body's constantly trying to maintain a proper pH. When we get sick, it all falls apart. The pHs start drifting off and going wild. But we can do all kinds of things to control pH. Now, one of the most disastrous things happening today is all these ads on TV about calcium. Got everybody scared to death about calcium. Now, every calcium that you will see advertised on TV is some form of calcium carbonate, ostracal, Tums are even advertising Tums as, as a um, health food now. They're all calcium carbonates, which are the very most alkaline form of calcium and also the most potent form of calcium. But if you have a high pH in the sevens, that is the opposite kind of calcium that your body needs. It does not want a very alkaline type of calcium. You, then you are going to stack yourself up for calcium deposits. Your body can't handle it. They'll deposit in your liver, your muscles, and various places. You do not want the carbonates. And the people are not thinking. In fact, they don't know. You can't think if you don't know. Uh, this 6.4 over 6.4 is just very slightly acid. All right, but that's where we want to keep it. But if, you have, if you're alkaline, don't take calcium carbonate. You want calcium, uh, lac I mean, if you're alkaline, you want calcium lactate, which will flow in harmony with an alkaline body. You can also take calcium gluconate, which is kind of a mild neutral calcium. You can take the calcium phosphates, 
but almost all calcium sold is calcium carbonate because they have you thinking that you need to take 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. Now this is not good thinking to think that you have to take a thousand milligrams of calcium a day. You should be getting most of your calcium or a lot of it from the foods you eat, not from a pill. Though we make five different kinds of calciums. But the only way you can get a thousand milligrams of calcium a day is to take the carbonate form because it's about 40 percent calcium, whereas the others are about 10 or 12 percent calcium. So you'd have to eat a whole bottle full of the other to try to get your thousand milligrams. But it's not good thinking to try to think that I must take a thousand milligrams through supplements every day. What you, want, what you want to do is to use calciums to help adjust these pHs so that you can pull the minerals out of the foods you eat. That's where you want to get most of your minerals out of the foods you eat, and you juggle parameters here trying to maneuver these pHs to where you can pull the minerals out of the foods you eat. That's what your thinking should be, not that I should take 1,000 milligrams a day. You're not it's not how much you take, it's how much you utilize that counts. It's not how much food you eat, but how, much, how efficiently you digest the food you eat that counts. And so we will cover that more thoroughly uh, next week on the digestion process. But so this pH is terrifically important. But when the pH gets off, the body's salts will start going up, no matter whether you're eating sodium chloride or not. Now, this is the number 6 to 7. That's a dash there, 6 to 7C is the perfect salt number if all the other numbers are correct. Now, as your body salts go up, weird things begin to happen. Salt is a powerful conductor of electricity. If you take distilled water, put two probes in it, and try to put electricity through it, nothing happens. It just is nothing. Just put a pinch of salt in there and zap. The electricity will flow through the water. It's a conductor. Now, as our salts go up, our ionization in our body speeds up. You will start depositing more cholesterol on the walls of your arteries, just like you're chrome plating a bumper of a car. It starts plating, and ionization speeds up in the whole body. Aging speeds up. All kinds of things speeds up that you don't want to speed up. Also, salts affect the soft muscles of the body. They begin to lose their tone. Your facial muscles will begin to sag. You see old folks who have drank virtually no water and sit around indoors, out of the sunlight, and the first thing you know, they're sagging. I've even seen them where their eyelids will bag down. They can't even support their own eyelids. They'll, they'll turn wrong side out. And because of high body salts, it affects the heart. It affects every soft muscle of the body. These salts do. You can wash those salts out in just a matter of hours with water and lower your salts. You can just measure them, watch them come down, just cl clean the body out with pure, soft water, which I think is distilled water. Now, just before we quit this evening, we're, we're just getting warmed up. Uh, I want to show you a book here. Now, as I said earlier, this, these programs are not to sell merchandise. This is not a huckstring program, but there are certain things I must bring to your attention. This book here, Sunlight Could Save Your Life is a book that every person who's interested in health should have. It doesn't just cover sunlight. It covers diet and all kind of things. It has charts, graphs. It's, it's really, it really covers the cholesterol, vitamins and minerals in relation to sunlight. It's a very, very comprehensive book. It was written by Dr. Zane Keim, medical doctor. He's done a lot of research, and this is a terrific book. And I wish everyone had this book. It sells for, I think, $12 plus about a dollar postage. You can order that we carry this book at our company and sell it to people. There's not enough profit in it to be a, a, a profit item, but everyone should read this book. And you can get it by writing Daily Manufacturing, Box 7, Rockwell, North Carolina, 28138 zip. And you'll find that one of the most fascinating books that you'll ever study or read. And it covers very comprehensively all these topics that we're, or some of these topics that we're covering here. And it's, it's really worthwhile. But these body salts are 
absolutely amazing as you study into them, what they do to the human body. We, we'll find that next week as we discuss the heart, how it affects the heart. How many more minutes do we have? Fifteen minutes left. Well, we've got a lot of time left. Oh, or is that seconds? <laughs> All right. Uh, we want to cover diet, and this will get into specific foods and the general trend of the diet. We like to put a little formula on here, 10, 10, 80. Before I, before I forget it on water, do you know how much water you actually utilize in your body a day? About 20,000 glasses of water a day. Fortunately, most of our water is recycled in the body and we lose a little bit of it and have to replace it to the little formula I gave you. But water is recycled in the body and used, otherwise we would die almost instantly. Now the perfect diet, and there is no such thing as a perfect diet, by the way, the, the day we live in now, we have destroyed our environment to the point where we cannot have a perfect diet. And don't let anybody tell you that you can. You cannot live a healthy, perfect diet out of the grocery store. You cannot do organic gardening and get a perfect vegetable because organic gardening rots stuff and puts it back in the soil. But if the trace minerals are missing in what you compost, how are you going to put something in that isn't there? You can grow better food organically. You can grow better food uh, in a lot of different ways. You can even grow high mineral food if you study agriculture. And there are a few people teaching this method of agriculture that's in harmony with this program. But the close to a perfect diet is 10% fats, 80% carbohydrates, and 10% protein. Now this protein is a real bomb today. We have just as much misconception on protein as we do on calciums that's being advertised and polyunsaturated fats. We are being totally uh, ignorant and deceived on proteins. I, I get more requests from people. They say, do you make anything for weightlifters, any high protein things and build muscles? And this is absolutely wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a total misconception. And if there's anything a weightlifter doesn't need, it's a high-protein diet. And I'm going to tell you a story uh, next week about a friend of mine who died taking high-protein diet, and it killed him. And it killed, well, these high-protein drinks that they outlawed about two years ago that women were taking, the pre-digested proteins, and they outlawed them, made them pull them off the shelf. They were killing women all over the country. And I'll show you next week why they killed these people. And it was just, it's just so simple that uh, it's amazing they didn't see it sooner. But 10% fat, 10% protein, and 80% complex carbohydrates. Now that's carrots, broccoli, fruits, you know, all of those type of things are complex carbohydrates. Now it's interesting down in Mexico, they found a tribe of people who were living very primitively and hadn't been contaminated by society and their diet was virtually this naturally. And these folks had a stamina that is, you, you think it's a fairy tale. Uh, several times a year they had races and they would race not for a mile, not for five miles, but for two or three hundred miles, night and day, nonstop. They had such stamina. No, no American athlete could even begin to keep up with them. And they, their diet just worked out to be a 10-10-80 diet. And they had unbelievable stamina for these foot races that they did. And uh, they'd have them two or three times a year. They were very low. They only ate meat maybe twice a year ceremonially. And they lived on the, the, the native fruits, vegetables, and grains, and so forth. And their stamina is, was just a, a legend. All right, in, in diet, I told you about carrots. You can't believe the difference in vegetables until you have experienced it. Like I say, we have a generation of young people that do not know what vegetables taste like because they have never tasted fresh-grown, high-mineral vegetables. 
Dr. Reams one time, he was a great agriculture man. In fact, he started out in agriculture and performed feats that people think are, just don't, don't believe it. He grew a watermelon with high mineral content, entered it in a state fair, won a blue ribbon. He was teaching in school at the time. Then he brought it back and put it on his desk and let it sit there until the next year, state fair. Took that same watermelon back, won another blue ribbon with it, brought it home and kept it there for the third year and it did not rot. Now Doc says that if you have the proper mineral content in vegetables, they never rot. They may dehydrate and shrink up from the moisture evaporating out, but they do not rot. And he used to grow vegetables and take them to the supermarkets and get premium prices on it. And they could sit there beside the other vegetables and they'd get rotten and unky. And his would sit there and be just, just pretty and nice and they would not rot. When the mineral content and the sugar content is properly balanced in a vegetable, it does not rot. And he has proven that and demonstrated it. And it's just, just fascinating what this man did. He told about a field of alfalfa that uh, Borden Company owns big citrus groves in Florida, and they commissioned him to plant a demonstration field of alfalfa. And they said, we want the best, I mean, we want just the, the ultimate in alfalfa planted in among our citrus grove. He said, now, are you sure of that? He says, yeah, we want the best. He said, the tallest best. They said, we want it really, you know, tall. So he balanced the soil, planted the alfalfa, and it grew higher than the young citrus grove. People flew in from Europe and everywhere, agriculture people, to see that alfalfa that was 11 feet high, if I remember right. And I've never seen any, I, I, I was born and raised on a farm, and in Illinois I did see alfalfa that maybe hit up to here. Down south here, most of it is about this high. And my neighbor just cut a field this week, and it was about, oh, maybe that high. But I have seen it up north in the black dirt, uh, up so high, but he had some 11 feet high. And he did all kinds of strange things with agriculture. He took an avocado tree that wouldn't bear in his backyard, and he hooked a 12 volt battery to it. He put some wires up around the top and an electrode in the ground and shot 12 volts through it, and the thing just took off like mad and bore avocados out galore. Just rejuvenated it by just running a little electric current through it. Well, we're beginning to discover some of those things now. And uh, there's a whole field of science now of electroculture. And it's just amazing what you can do with plants. And in the future, with genetic engineering and electroculture, we'll have some very interesting things developed in the agriculture field. Now, this 10-10-80 diet will probably be pretty good for most people. But now, you go to the bookstore now, and you've got 100 books there on some kind of diet, the pretty can diet and the pretty diet and the ugly diet and the up and down and ever sideways diet. And almost every one of these diets will do something for you, and particularly it will leave you mineral deficient. Almost any drastic diet that you go on will leave you more mineral deficient. It may make you lose weight. It may even make you temporarily feel better, but you will probably end up needing to supplement your diet with some supplements because you will grow mineral deficient. Uh, this latest craze, and they had it on TV a, a few weeks ago on Good Morning America, the uh, Fit for Life book, and it's selling like mad, and I think last night on the news they were downgrading it, uh, uh, saying it wasn't any good, but it will help you in many ways except you'll go mineral deficient and you eventually get sick on it. Almost any diet you'll eventually get sick. Now, I'm going to show you next week how on a, even a raw vegetarian diet, how you will probably get sick and be, become deficient in all kinds of things on a totally raw vegetarian diet. And we will discuss how to, to, what to do with your vegetables to get the maximum nutrient out of it. Now, we have about three or four or five minutes left. If anyone has any questions on tonight, we seem to have a little trouble getting questions out of people. We have five minutes left. Do we have any questions bearing on this that you would like to ask? I will try to answer them if you will ask them. Everybody gets real gun shy here on the questions. Ask a question, anything. 
Want to know the price of the stocks today? I'll tell you. <laughs> what? The heart is, is, is one of what we call a, a soft muscle. Uh, the muscles that hold your eyelids up and the facial muscles. That's why you see a lot of people as they get older, their face just looks like the meat is just virtually sagging off of it because of high salts. Now, any other questions? You're grinning like you have one. Do you have a question? <laughs> To raise the alkaline or acid level. It's an amazing thing about, uh, you can take a grapefruit, for instance. You, you, you put some pH paper in it, and I brought some tonight. I'd aim to let you, uh, after this is turned off, I'll let you play with this on your saliva pH. You can take a grapefruit, and I've demonstrated this. You can put the pH paper in it. It's very acid in the juice. I take that same grapefruit and put it in my mouth. I, or I can test my mouth first, and it, it will be slightly alkaline. The mouth will. I will dump this grapefruit juice or a chunk of the grapefruit in my mouth, chew it just a couple of chews, and put the pH paper in there, and it will be extremely alkaline. It flips over. So a lot of fruits reverse and become alkaline in the body and have alkaline ash, as we call it. And so most all vegetables are alkalizing to the body, and most fruits. Now, cranberry juice will acidify you. It will make your urine very acidic and acidify the body. Cranberry juice does. But a lot of fruits that are with acid in themselves will have an alkalizing influence on the body. In fact, most fruits. Now, we're going to next week discuss the lemon and lemon water and what it can do to the body. It, this, this will amaze you. But we are virtually out of time this evening. But, the, but now we're just hitting highlights here, just trying to tantalize you. This thing goes so deep on all of these, you can spend a week on any one subject. But it, it's really fascinating to watch this formula develop and we're going to develop it more next week and get into nitrogen. So I think this will conclude our um, program this evening. And if there's any questions, there are always more questions. As soon as they turn the cameras off, everybody will have a question. <laughs> and we'll let you play with the pH paper then. So that will conclude this evening's topic. <laughs>